Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on John Winthrop in a model for Christian charity. John, Governor John Winthrop uh, was born 1588, lived till 1649. He was the first and the most, uh, or he was the first governor of Massachusetts and ruled on and off or, or governed on and off for nearly 30 years. Uh, he came from a wealthy background and ultimately fled to Europe um, in the in the earlier part or in the earlier part of the 1600s when England in, internally was facing its own civil war a lot of uh, challenge and stress around uh, religion this was during a time in which England would eventually have a civil war its king would be executed so regicide was committed uh, there's a lot of different strife going on in England that ultimately sent um, a variety of people t away from England, in this case for Winthrop, into the Americas. So he became governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, and when he arrived here in 1630, I'm sorry, he was he was governor on and off for, uh, for 20 years, not 30 years. Um, when he arrived here in 1630, he wrote this speech called A Model for Christian Charity. It was a speech that, well, it was a speech he spoke as the ship he was on was coming into harbor, was, you know, settling in on, in Massachusetts. Uh, and it was really an attempt to inspire the men and few women that were on that boat to be charitable in a very Christian way. And so that's really the formation of this. It's a rallying speech about the world in which these people are soon to be emerging and how it should be dealt with. He also wrote the examination of, or I shouldn't say wrote, he, well, I guess you could say wrote, wrote uh, examination of, of Anne Hutchinson in 1637 and that's, that was focused on the excommunication of Anne Hutchinson, a famous resident of Massachusetts who was basically excommunicated from the community uh, for her particular views and ways of teaching the Bible. So let's take a look at this work. To apply this to the works of mercy, this law requires two things. First, that every man afford his help to another in every want or distress. Second, that he perform this out of the same affection which makes him careful of his own goods, according to the words of our Savior. So, right, you know, this idea of charity, the, what, what Winthrop is trying to get people to recognize is that salvation, and in other words, succeeding in this colony, requires people to not just help themselves and help others, but to do so to the degree that they would help themselves. That is, it, you, it isn't just enough to do a little, but charity, true charity, means you do more. You, you do it until it, it hurts you to a certain degree. And that's something we don't understand about charity today is, you know, our, our modern idea of charity is we give when it's convenient. Real charity, true charity, in the Christian tradition, and many other traditions, is you give until it actually does hurt and impact you. You don't give just when it's convenient, but you give as a part to the point at which you are you feel the impact. That's what true charity is considered. Thirdly, the law of nature would give no rules for dealing with enemies, for all are to be considered as friends in the state of innocence, but the gospel commands to love an enemy. So again, as Winthrop is trying to get these people rallied up and, and prepared to live in this new world, he's saying we have to abandon our enemies or abandon our idea of the enemy. And if we have an enemy, that just means we love the enemy. right? He's painting this picture in which everybody has to be interdependent in order for people to be independent, in order for people to succeed and to live on their own in this new world. They really do require one another. There is a time when a Christian must sell and give to the poor, as they did in the Apostle times. There is also a time when a Christian, though they give not all, must give beyond their ability, as they of Macedonia, 2 Corinthians 8. Likewise, community, likewise, community of perils, 
call for an extra call for extraordinary liberality and so doth community and some special service for the church so again he's asking for his people he's asking for them to do more than just what is convenient that as a community of peril there is extreme liberality and there is a special service needed for these people so the way to draw men to the works of mercy is not by force of argument from the goodness or necessity of the work for though this this cause may enforce a rational mind to some present act of mercy it is as is frequent in experience yet it cannot work a habit such a habit in a soul as shall make it prompt upon all occasions to produce the same effect but framing these affections of love in the heart which will as naturally bring forth the other as any cause doth produce the effect so again Winthrop here is kinda of stepping back and he's saying I can I can give you all sorts of arguments and give you all sorts of reasons for doing this but that isn't what's going to work that isn't what yet you know he says yet it cannot work such a habit in a soul those those things are not going to be profound enough to move the ways in which we need to move but by framing these affections of love in the heart which will which will as naturally bring forth the other any case doth protect produce the effect any cause doth produce to base these ideas to base this in love of mankind not in it's good to protect you so you should protect me but in the to love one another that will produce the effect that will result in well hopefully uh, as Winthrop is hoping the protection and the, the longevity of the colony all the parts of this body being thus united are made so continuous in a special relation as they must as they must needs partake of each other's strength and infirmity joy and sorrow weal and woe if one member suffers all suffer with it if one be in honor all rejoice with it and so Winthrop w is trying to convey to the people that there has to be a unanimity there, uh, there has to be a unanimity here in which they all are working together because the strengths is everybody you know everybody benefits from the strengths and nobody benefits from the sorrow everybody benefits from the wealth nobody benefits from the woe so there's an attempt to make sure everybody is ready to do their part and to push forward and succeed in this new land now the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our prosperi prosperity posterity, is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end we must be knit together in, those, in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in, broadly, in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluity, superfluities for the supply of others necessity we must uphold a familiar commer commerce together in all meekness gentleness patience and liberality we must delight in each other make others conditions our own rejoice together mourn together labor and suffer together always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work as members of the same body so shall we keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace and so again, you know, the the power of this and the the attempts in which Winthrop is creating and forging this community. Notice the the use of we, the emphasis of we, and the ways in which we must be a community. For we must consider that we shall be as an as a city upon a hill the eyes of all people are upon us so that if we shall deal falsely with our god in this work we have undertaken and so cause him to withdraw his present uh his present out from us we shall be made a story and by word through the world we shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of god and all professors forsake 
all professors for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whither we are going. So Winthrop is framing their mission to the Americas as, you know, God's work. And when he says, for we must consider that we shall be a city upon a hill, that's a biblical reference. And there is an attempt here to say, we have an opportunity to create a Christian world, a Christian land here. And everybody is watching, right? The eyes of all people are upon us. So they have to be true. They have to be faithful. They have to be committed to this. And if they are good, if they are committed, if they are faithful, then God is going to bless them. God is going to continue to allow them to be successful. But if they don't, they're going to become a bad example of how supposed Christians are, right? His present from us, we shall be made a story and by word and by word through the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the to speak evil of the ways of God. So it's the whole world is watching. We need to do this and we need to do this right by God or else we leave open the opportunity for evil, big or small, to come and do harm um, by Christianity. All right, so hopefully those are some of the ideas and themes that are present in this in this writing and as you read it I hope you come across other things that tie into this and some of your own certainly some of your own ideas thank you very much for listening I will see you in the next lecture